Warning. The following podcast contains nicotine, fat clouds, coarse language, and other adult shit. It is intended for a mature audience. Listener discretion is advised. Right, gang, our next guest, you know the flavors, you know the feelings behind his name. You've sampled his product for sure and probably are in love with it. If you've ever smoked or vaped Bubba Kush or OG Kush, for any time from now, going back to the early 90s, this is the man who bred that strain and they are all from the same mother plant. Like, they all came from something he grew in his house in Florida back in the 90s. Ladies and gentlemen, gang, CBD gang at home, listening and watching on Twitch or on YouTube, let's give a big CBD source welcome to our guest for today, Matt Bubba Kush Burger. I want to take it back, man. I want to go back to the OG days, the very beginning. Of your uh, rise to uh, cannabis world infamy. I want to hear your whole story. <laughs> like, one thing that I love about this gig is being able to basically talk to legends and kind of like hear your, your whole deal. And, like, for a lot of people who don't know who you are, be able to expose you to like new ears and eyes. Um, people who are into CBD and, and might not know much about the the more OG strains of cannabis and all of that. Um, now that you're breaking into the CBD space, got this. It's called Itemist. We're trying. I'm gonna t- I'm gonna hit it right now because I want to get a little bit you know a little bristling before we start. The bristling. Taking three hits. It's three little sprays. Like it's not what's recommended on the packaging, but you know <laughs> we go harder here. <laughs> and that's like 20 milligrams each for you know one spray you were doing a little math on it yeah the the new bottles are going to do less uh oh really well, the, the new bottles spray 0.1 milliliters oh per spray how many? So, so you'll get about 100 sprays out of the bottle uh, okay i found we got that, it. you know i was testing the thc product on people and uh you have a tendency to want to keep spraying it <laughs> you know, you'll, you'll spray it you'll start to feel something and then you'll go ah you know i can do more and then you do more and then before you know it you hit the line and no return and then, I, <laughs> and then then i chop you up to what i call a victim uh, oh, another yeah. victim went and talked to jesus for two hours or yeah charlie <laughs> charlie brown's teacher was there for two hours talking to him too I, i've had so many different uh people do just a little too much and i call like, that new year's that's New Year's for me. New Year's Day <laughs> was my experience with that recently. Yeah, I think it's uh people get that um that old school, especially OGs who were around during the time of Banaka, yes. and you just like you start pounding it, don't realize how far you're going with it, and you know, yeah, off the deep end. It is. It's it, it can be dangerous <laughs> stuff. It's just so you are making it. You are going to make a THC version, huh? Yeah, I've already experimented with it. That's dope. Yeah, yeah it's, it's super concentrated. Like when it it's is. in that form, man. It's very and cool. It, and it's just, you know, the carrier solution so unique. It, it thins out the viscosity so much that it literally goes right through your uh, mucous membrane. So what you're is swallowing carrier? none of it. Right, right. It just goes right in. Yeah. What is, what is tincture, the carrier solution? Tinctures, you reflex swallow most of it and it goes through your digestive system. So you're only getting about 10% of the product or 10% of the actual medicine whereas uh this uh lowers it by well viscosity is measured in brooksfield units uh tinctures roughly a 40 brooksfield unit uh the stuff that i'm making is a nine in brooksfield units so it's i have to look that up and see what the hell that means 
the bio <laughs> the bioavailability it so on thin. it yeah the yeah it's like is like 100 percent almost that's dope so we will definitely get more into that but i want to go back i want to take us all the way back back in the day go back when we were young take me back <laughs> yeah exactly so where you you started out in florida um, and yeah. you're back in Florida right now. Well, I mean, you're only temporarily in Florida, just yeah. visiting relatives. But you started off in, you know, well, give me a little. Let's let's go back to the early days. I want to hear your your weed man van story. We call it <laughs> the weed man van story. The first time you met the weed man, first whether it invo- whether it involves a van or just like <laughs> the first time you ever smoked weed, like the first time you were introduced to the plant. Um, I had three older brothers. Um, okay. And they, they got a kick out of, uh, I guess, just watching me do stupid shit. So they <laughs> they give me little hits off the joint every once in a while. I never I didn't really get high the first couple times. And I'm talking, I was like, this was when I was probably 11, 10, okay. 11, 12. Wow. So I, I didn't really get high the first couple times they let me try it. But the first time I did get high, I was with my older brother, um, Michael. <laughs> he had a homemade bong that he made from chemistry class took a graduated cylinder home from chemistry class and oh, nice. made a made a homemade bong and, and uh he gave me a bong head and i just remember laying on the floor in this room looking up at the ceiling going oh my god this is awesome and, <laughs> uh, you know back then you, you you were you know when you get high you became a giggle puss and he just laughed for hours and hours and hours. Um, yeah, man. It was, uh, yeah, that was a good memory. <laughs> I like it. Giggle puss. That's funny. Like, <laughs> you, you don't even think about it, but, like, when you're, especially when you're young, like, not even a teenager, um, your brain doesn't know what the hell's going on as far as, like, you just, for so many years, you've just had your focus of this is life and this is how I am in my body and this is how the world is but then you start experimenting with you know altering your brain with chemistry a little bit and literally using actual chemistry equipment like breaking bad <laughs> <laughs> to smoke out of a lot of people's first experience is like is like an apple or something yeah but using an actual like well, lab set <laughs> yeah that's pretty dope <laughs> yeah good times good memories so you, you were taking puffs off of your bros' joints and whatnot. You finally got the bong, but when you were you were in that giggle puss state, where you like, I guess my life has changed now because I've been w- woken up to something that I did not know really existed. Like when you first realized what getting high was, I don't know. Did it did it give you some kind of insight? Like I'm going to be doing this more often. Oh yeah, I mean, I knew I was hooked. I mean, it was just too. <laughs> It was too fun, you know, and, and uh, you know, I was always an experimenter of, of things, you know, I was never the the guy that was afraid to jump in the water without testing it first. Mm. I always, I always dive into everything I do with full commitment. That's cool. Yeah. Well, that's the, the people that, that do that are, are the ones that figure out new stuff and innovate. After you started yeah, look where getting it got into me. like, <laughs> I'm sure you hit that bomb back again. Thought, like you didn't just do the one, wasn't a one time deal. Today when I was 13, when I was sneaking in, sneaking in everybody's room looking for weed, sneaking, <laughs> pinching little buds from my brothers because they, they weren't going <laughs> to sell me any. And then okay. finally, finally, I figured out how to get it on my own. <laughs> like start a paper route to make some money so you can buy weed off of somebody honestly i did i was a very <laughs> i was a very busy kid i cut my parents yard i washed the cars i got allowance <laughs> and then i started washing dishes at uh the holiday inn so i'm 13 uh with a real job washing dishes because they were sick of me being up there all the time playing video games so they were like you know why don't you just work here i was like okay they put me to work at the holiday Inn uh restaurant washing dishes so at 13 you know i was clearing 50 100 bucks a week easy um i always i I always had the week yeah what year are we talking about like put me in a time frame here 13 we're talking like 84 okay that's the height the height of arcades i would imagine right yeah 
Mario Brothers. I, I beat Mario Brothers in the in the actual arcade. I actually wow. I saved the princess off a of quarter. Wow. <laughs> you were the you were like one of my claims to fame. <laughs> original like breaking past pinball into the arcade machines. One quarter and done. That's yeah. awesome. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's I'll, cool. I'll never forget that day. <laughs> Dude, that was a time period, man. I was I was a little like I was born in seventy seven, so I'm a little uh, not that early into arcades. But I did I did go to arcades as a kid. My parents were not rich, so like I had a buddy who uh, his parents were rich, and like every time I went to their house, they'd go, we'd take they take us to the arcade, drop us off. They'd give me ten dollars worth of quarters, give him like I don't know how much quarters, probably unlimited. And but it was cool that someone else's parents were giving me money that's cool. to play yeah, video games. Cool. Oh man, it was dropping so, you off so at that... Chuck E. Cheese or <laughs> <laughs> it was more like the mall. Like here's the, mall, the arcade, arcade at the mall. Right? You're safe in the mall. Like <laughs> someone tried to steal you from an arcade in the mall. They got to drag you through the whole mall. You know, it's not going to work. No. So it's just like <laughs> one place. <laughs> but things funny. were a lot. Things were a lot looser back then. Yes, as far they were. as good like, times. You, OGs understand, you know, it's not like today. You don't have kids, do you? No, no kids. No, me neither. So I don't even know, but I yeah. I know from like my siblings and stuff how uh, super controlling everything is now. Like everyone's just worried about their kids nonstop and on top of them nonstop. It just wasn't that way back in the 80s and no, 90s. They're just faces <laughs> glued to their phone. <laughs> That's true. They, even I don't babies. even know how to talk to them. Like my little nephews and cousins and stuff, I don't know what to say to them. They're you gotta constantly DM them. just staring into their phone. You slide into their DMs. <laughs> <laughs> it's the only way. That's funny. All right, so you were working at the at the Holiday Inn, so you were making enough quarters to play to play Mario and enough uh, money to buy your your child weed, your yeah. childhood weed. I've always had how a did... stash. How did you get like how did, how as a kid back in that time period did did just the normal Joe Schmo go about finding it, like a weed man like getting uh, in? older brothers older brothers friends they were the connect uh, yeah you know once once I got old enough and you know past the point of no return uh, <laughs> you know they they started hooking me up because they knew I'd like, just find it and steal it from them if they didn't that's funny. <laughs> Did they expect? Did they like expect a um a little like toll from you? Like you had to pay in every week with a little oh, yeah. like nug no, or me, something. Me, me and my older brother <laughs> started. Uh, we'd split. You know, we'd get a quarter and split it. Um, and, or we'd get ounces and split it. He was selling weed too. Um, then how much it, is, and then I started did it, selling. Do you remember the prices of the street prices back then? Like, oh how yeah, much would it... yeah. Well, back then we only had you had either brown brown weed it was jamaican brick weed um uh, or you had green weed there was no uh there weren't really any names yet you know you, you <laughs> had your maui Valley and you had your columbian gold right um, all the strains were named after regions from where they, where came they were from. Yeah, yeah you know we didn't have you know back then there was no skunk there was no you know funky name stuff there was no orange sherberts or you know the it was just straight up where it came from. You know, if right. it was Hawaiian, it was Maui Waui. If it was Colombian, it was Colombian gold or Afghani. Um, right, right. So and there's no fancy packaging. And we, not... we called uh we called green weed crippy. The kryptonite. The crypto. Oh, that's cool. The kryptonite. They killed Superman. Yeah. That's um, cool. <laughs> so that was the green weed. And you, Dude, you buy DC grams, comics were you get grams of that for like 20 bucks a gram people would try to get you for um, typical quarters back then were 30 bucks. So you got a quarter for 30 bucks. Or if you tried to find green weed, the crippy, you bought it by the gram and it'd be like, you know, 60 bucks an eighth or 20 bucks a gram kind of thing. It was real expensive. And a lot of times it wasn't even that great. I remember it wasn't cured right a lot. It was still spongy and wet. You'd have to let it dry. You know, people, it was just, but it was green. So you, you bought it. It was, you, know. <laughs> you bought what was available. Yeah. That's all. <laughs> and it, well, and you tried to always, of course, find the best. And 
So did you, were you like a like a little childhood connoisseur? Like you had different dealers that had different strains. I Dude, was. That's awesome. <laughs> I was. I was a bad kid. I was slinging <laughs> slinging weed to all my friends on nice. top on top, and then uh, I had a job and I was washing the car. I was making a lot of money when I was a little kid. <laughs> <laughs> Holiday Inn was just the front. Yes, for their was. whole operation. I was I was even selling weed to the uh, ladies at the front desk at the Holiday Inn. Nice, <laughs> you were the connect. Yeah, thirteen year old kids selling weed to you know thirty forty year old women. Back <laughs> <laughs> they got to get it somewhere. <laughs> well, they could only get garbage. I was the one that got all the crippy. So they were like, "Oh my god, you get that?" I go, Hell yeah. <laughs> we, that's funny we have a segment on the show called geek session we're going to definitely use crippy that's a cool that's a cool name for weed like we like we would talk about more like comic book and nerdy stuff with weed and i didn't even know that existed but that's great the crypto. That's funny. <laughs> now crypto means something completely different yeah the crypto a lot of people think and... it came from the crypt you know it's, it's, but it's not any crypt uh, keeper kind of thing. It's kryptonite. It's the shit that kills Superman. Right. <laughs> was, it, was it super green? Was it like really, really green? Oh yeah, like gl- oh, glowing. Yeah. It was. It was like fluorescent green. And a lot of times, like I said, it, they didn't cure it really well. You know, looking back, um, it, it was uh, really fresh looking. Like it was still chlorophyll. Oh really? Yeah. Yeah. You get every once in a while, you get a chunk that just came right off the planet of the bike. You'd be like, man, this ain't even burning. I just paid 30 bucks for this and won't even burn. Then you'd Jeez. let it sit out and you'd be like, I'm losing all the weight now, letting it right. dry. Right. And, right. And also That's probably Florida, how they get you. They sell it to you when it's wet. It's yeah, like when they... Florida shit doesn't to, dry. <laughs> it's like the, one of the weird scams of supermarkets where they constantly like soak the plants, soak the vegetables so they weigh more when you put them on the scale. <laughs> I never thought it's like about lettuce that. lettuce that weighs three <laughs> times as much. That's funny. Yeah, I never thought about that. I'm shake <laughs> off my vegetables next time I'm in my grocery There you store. go, yeah. <laughs> it's the nickel and dimes. Speaking of nickel and dimes, by the way, dime bags and nickel bags meant something back then. Like oh, people yeah. actually bought in that quantity. And a dime yeah, bag well, would get you something rather than practically nothing now, right? Yeah, well, when we were desperate and everybody, you know, any of our sources were out, we'd go to, you know, one of the ghetto neighborhoods and buy these little nickels in brown envelopes. Mm-hmm. They were just filled with seeds and stems and crap. <laughs> you're, you know, you're lucky you got a joint out of the damn thing. Jeez. But that, that was always sketchy, too, you know, driving around in these you know, really bad neighborhoods on dirt roads right? And possibly getting chased by a bunch of people. And yeah. It was, yeah. You're not there. It, it was pretty me. sketchy. You're not there to do honest work. You're there for, with bad intentions. You're there to it's buy true. drugs. It's true. <laughs> and back then, back then we're talking Reagan era, right? So okay. this was the war on the height of the war on drugs. This just say no time period. And um, literally, the Nancy neighborhood Reagan. was right next to my middle school. <laughs> could oh, walk. Yeah, it was... <laughs> like lunchtime. <laughs> hey, let's go run next. Run it's over a dime back detour. Yeah. Let's go get a dime. <laughs> Did you smoke at lunch and then come back? Oh yeah. Did you get? You were high during school sometimes. Oh yeah. We we'd meet in the dirt parking <laughs> lot on the side of uh, on the side of our high school. Um. I remember one time, this is a funny story, where uh, we uh, we didn't have any weed, and uh, we knew that, we knew my one buddy had a bud in his car, but it wasn't his lunch period. So somebody had the idea to get, to break in his car and grab the nug. <laughs> <laughs> so he, he gets him, he gets the nug out of the dude's car, and this was like this, it was like a hash plant bud. I'll never forget this story. Oh, wow. Because this bud did not stop burning. It went around a circle with like six people at least five times. We were just like, oh my God, is this the never ending bowl? <laughs> and we we were we were so high. And uh that was uh that was the day the space shuttle was going off. And uh we're sitting in the parking lot and we're high as fuck and we're watching the space shuttle and it fucking blew up. Oh, you're talking about nineteen eighty six, the challenge. Yeah. 
Yeah, it blew wow. up. And we didn't know what was happening. And we're high as fuck. Oh so we my just start God. making we're making jokes like, oh shit, it blew up. Ah, blah, blah, blah. I'm making jokes. And then all of a sudden it comes over the intercom that the space shuttle blew up. And we were all just like, ooh, we're dicks, man. Oh <laughs> man. It was just such a sobering moment. Cause I mean, you went from like high and laughing and then super bummed out. It was just like yeah it was like oh man dude and when reality hits you like that us like a really crazy extreme thing hits you when you're in that kind of state especially when you're a kid and you haven't been getting stoned that that much that's got to be like what the like a sledgehammer to the face did it snap you out of it or were you just like whoa like just in it too deep whenever i whenever i think about getting high at school that's the story i think of because it was such a uh I don't know. It's something, you know, like Kennedy died. You know, you knew right. where you were at when Kennedy died. Or our parents That's true, did. man. Everyone uh, it was knows one that. Of those kind of moments. It's a 9 11 moment. You know, like yeah. everyone knows where they exactly. were. Exactly. I, I was, exactly. for me, for me, I was home from school sick that day and I was watching it on TV by myself and I had no one to like talk to about it. I was just like, this is great. This is really happening. Like, just mind <laughs> yeah, blown as a kid, not knowing, like, no one to talk to and like to try to say like this is really happening because i guess in a lot of schools like people were watching it on tv because like one of the astronauts was a teacher so like yep. a lot of schools across the country were kind of like doing a simulcast type of thing so really kind of uh traumatized a lot of a lot of kids yeah that, that was a tough moment yeah I, I remember i was driving down uh i was driving down vine almost almost the hollywood boulevard and uh, I was hung over as fuck. I, I literally, I was partying all night the night before. And uh, I was on my way to get my morning juice at the juice fountain. Um, I get fresh, you know, strawberry, you know, smoothies and stuff mm-hmm. at this little Mexican uh, fruit juice or juice factory. I go there every day. And it was already 11, 12 o'clock. You know, I just crawled out of bed and driving down the road and I get a phone call from my mother. And she's like, where are you? I'm like, what do you mean? She's like freaking out. I'm like, I'm driving to get my juice. What's going on? <laughs> she's like, she's like, you don't know what happened? And I'm like, no, I have no clue. She's like, the shit's hit the fan this time. And I'm oh, like, no. what do you mean? She's like, they crashed the planes in the night in the in the twin towers and blah, blah, blah. I'm like, holy oh, yeah. shit. Yeah, I didn't remember exactly where I was. Everyone remembers that one. <laughs> Hollywood yeah, that and was... Vine. <laughs> It's it's strange when you have these like collective massive incidents like this 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 pandemic we're in right now. I mean, when people listen to this in the future, this will be over hopefully. But like when when something's hitting a lot of people at once, um, everyone has like a a shared societal memory, and then you've got like your own individual memories. But like it almost feels like uh, you were all in it together. You know, like everyone has an experience, and it's, it ties people of that time period together in a weird way you know what i mean That's true. especially the closer you are to to the event like you were in florida that when that spaceship went up that was probably out of like cape canaveral or something right it was probably not too far from oh yeah are oh, no, you seeing it see in the it. sky oh yeah you watched oh yeah wow can, yeah we used to watch the shuttles all the time you can see them easy from orlando uh cape canaveral is less than a 45 minute uh drive from my high school it's like Cocoa Beach. That was all our surfing ground. So, I mean, you could see it clear as day from the high school parking lot. Dude, that's amazing. There are probably not that many people, not that many kids that were outdoors watching that other than, like, in Florida, you guys. Like, probably most of the kids were in the school, like, watching it on TV, right? I would imagine. That's why you guys got to be able to sneak out. Yep. And smoke that magical hash nug. But most of the time, they'd let... They'd, let it, the whole schools out they'd let the whole school out of class but uh to watch that was mostly when we were younger though in high oh, school okay. in high school they didn't let the whole school out it would have been chaos right <laughs> so you guys were probably some of the few high school students on earth that saw it with your own eyes yeah wow we were, we were lucky we had that lunch period and you were looking at it through like the le- the crypto lenses. The crippy lens. <laughs> Blinded by kryptonite. <laughs> it's like the Emerald City glasses over your eyes. That's crazy. <laughs> wow. 
Wow, good story. It's very cool. I didn't. I don't never talk to anyone who actually saw it with their own eyes. That's pretty amazing. Damn, and stunned off your asses. And yet you have to wander back into class after that, like traumatized. Do you remember that? Do you remember coming? coming back oh, in yeah nobody said anything everybody was really quiet it was just yeah everybody was like oh my god what just happened did they send kids home early or anything no i don't remember i don't remember that so crazy all right yeah. so wow it's a good story <laughs> i was not expecting that one I, that's awesome <laughs> <laughs> so I, I, I got lots of stories. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm, I'm trying to make a, uh, I'm trying to link together, I guess, with your earliest purchases of these little shitty dime bags that were all, you know, swag and shake and stems and whatnot. You were getting seeds in there. And that's probably the first time you ever held seeds, I would imagine. Did you put two and two together? Like, maybe I could plant these or maybe I could do something with this. Yeah, I started, I started throwing seeds in my backyard around 13, 14. Um, <laughs> we were in, uh, I was in agriculture class too. Um, but before that, yeah, I was throwing seeds in my backyard. They'd get about a foot or two before my dad would chop them down. Uh, <laughs> he didn't know what they were. He just thought they uh-huh. were weeds. Right. So then I moved to the, to the area behind my backyard, which was a, a I had a fence and then there were woods and then I started growing back in the woods. Um, rarely successful. Uh, there was <laughs> always deer or rabbits or some, something would eat it. Nice. Um, so Not nice for you, but nice for the rabbits, I guess they're getting all that like THCA and whatnot. Getting these yeah. benefits. I didn't know they could have, <laughs> <laughs> but most of the time they'd get chewed up. Um, I didn't really, uh, and then, in the agriculture class we used to pop seeds in there and my teacher would let us let him get about that big too and then he'd chop them down how, how he big just, he, he wanted us to have some kind of sense of accomplishment like <laughs> we grew something on our own and he, you know <laughs> he was kind of proud of us but at the same time he's like you can't do that no, but no, uh no. He, he'd just give can't us fired, these looks he'd, he'd give us these looks like i know what you're doing <laughs> don't keep doing it <laughs> he was cool mr ascona where funny. he's at it's like a, a mentor for growing weed in the yeah. school <laughs> yeah he was, he was cool and then uh then from high school um i went to university of florida so i went up to gainesville and that's where i met um uh, my one roommate who taught me how to grow indoors and that was pretty much all she wrote. How did he learn? Um, you know, I don't know who taught him. I probably this did is like back bef- then. This is before the internet, so any kind of shit like this, you either had to find some kind of rare book, or, like, or someone was, just passing on like learned knowledge. I yeah, guess I don't Ag know helped, how, but I don't know how Kelly did it. But he was already crossed. He was already pollinating shit. Like the very first Kush cross he made, it was called KY. We had KX, KY, and KZ. I forget what the pollen he used was, but he made the very, very first Kush cross, the KY. And it was, they... it was weird too, because when I brought the KY out to LA, so I brought the KY, the Kush, and just straight Bubba. Bubba hadn't been crossed with the Kush yet. Um, but we were growing the KY because it was a great producer and uh, it still had a lot of cushiness to it. It wasn't the OG by any means. It was good, but um, it just, it was a good producer, but it started giving people rashes. Like I never knew that. What? Could, yeah. They, my, my one boy, Josh D, he get, uh, he get rashes on his arms, like kind of red bumps. Huh. And, uh, and Kenji, Kenji also would break out from it. Kenji from uh, Cypress Hill, the Cypress Hill crew. Uh, he'd get these red fucking bumps too. You so were hanging he, out with him? Him at the? You knew him at the time? 
Yeah, yeah. Kenji, uh, Kenji and Be Real were the ones that found the Bubba Fish Sea. So they came You're over. Kidding. And, yeah, they came over and grabbed uh, the bag of Bubba. And when they got home, they called me up and said, hey, we found a seed. And it had to be the Bubba Kush. I mean, the Kush had, you know, the Kush is very temperamental in a lot of ways. And it does have a tendency to hermaphrodite if it's stressed out. Um, so, and I know the Bubba doesn't. Bubba was such a hardy strain. Nothing would freak that thing out. I mean, bugs wouldn't even get on it. Like, it was resilient to anything. So, you All right, wait a up. second. We're going to need to break this story down a little bit more. Something <laughs> happened with the Bubba Kush seed initially that it it was completely gone, right? It, you, you kind of, like, it vanished or it had... Just the Bubba. Just the Bubba, right. Yeah, the Bubba's gone. Nobody I know has the original Bubba cut. It just, it didn't, it didn't grow well next to the Kush or the Bubba Kush. The, the straight Bubba was so short. It was a true indica. I mean, the thing, you're lucky it got this big in, you know, eight weeks. How tall is that? Like two... Well, It'd get two, three feet, and mm -hmm. and everything else would be four, you know. Well, it'd get two feet, maybe a little more. And mm -hmm. the Kush, the Kush always finished out at about four feet from the time that we turned the lights back. So the Bubba always had, uh, you always had to balance your lights different. So they didn't oh. grow nice next to each other. And when you only have, you know, four, six lights, it's really hard to grow different size strains. You try and grow things that, you know, grow nice together. And the Bubba just didn't grow nice next to everything <laughs> else. And then the Bubba Kush came and it was just, I wouldn't want to say it was better than the Bubba. It was different. It, it had that Kush, you know, funk to it. Whereas the Bubba was more like a, a sage, not a sage. It was like a, the only way I can describe the bubble is like a magical, like mint forest or, you know, just the thoughts of like fresh air and, and mountain springs and, wow. you know, sage smells and woodsy smells. And like that was the straight bubba. Um, the bubble Kush has a little bit of that. It has that woodsy uh, kind of oaky foresty smell to it a little bit but then the then the funk from the kush kicks in and it just makes it totally unique I, mean, I could never describe the flavors of either i could never tell you what kush tastes like i could never tell you what bubba kush tastes like they're just such unique flavors there's nothing to compare it to right right you know, that's it's the like thing with you flavors you're never to. trying when you hit a flavor that you've never experienced in your life and that's something that happens one thing that you know like once you get past being a kid and a teenager and you, when you're an adult and your palate changes and you're able to like experience, you rarely experience new things outside of like gourmet restaurants, trying new vegetables and fruits and different meat and things like that, that you've never tried before. Uh, new experiences with taste and smell get fewer and far between. You know what I mean? Like it's very yeah. rare that you get new stuff because you've, you've experienced such a cornucopia of smells and tastes in your life. The older you get, you know, your palate gets more refined. You know what you like. But that's something that they don't talk about much, but with uh, cannabis and hemp, different types of terps and combinations of flavonoids and all that stuff um, really do have their own individual thing that when you smoke it or when you vape it or whatever, however you're taking it in, you really do start to, you, you get hit with things that you've, sometimes it's reminiscent of other things, but sometimes it's like, this is a brand new thing that I'm experiencing. It's like, you're not only getting a brand new high, but you're also getting that experience of a brand new taste, smell, sensation combination that is like really unique to uh, one of those awesome, unique experiences that when you see something or try something that you've never tried before, um, it's really novel. You know what I mean? It's like it's hitting me as novel and it is hard to explain the same way. It's hard to explain like an, what LSD does to you, to someone who's never tried LSD or something like that. You know, it's really sure. a tough tough experience to try to break that down sort of like trying to explain colors to a blind person it's like really really tricky to it someone is, who's yeah. never, never taken yeah, a puff a analogy oh thanks <laughs> <laughs> but yeah like it's it's pretty cool i, I want to know like because i'm not a, a like 
botanist or a seed master? What what's the technical word for someone who does this? Who does genetics with uh, seeds and stuff? Like, what's is there a word for it? Uh, like geneticist, geneticist, reader, geneticist right. yeah. So how did you? How did you? You're the one who who came up with the Bubba seeds originally, right? You're the originator of that, or you're the originator no, the, of Bubba Kush. The the straight Bubba seed came from uh, my buddy Fat Larry. He went to school in Tulane, New Orleans. Okay, uh, he right. Was, he was from he was from NorCal, so he'd have all his weed shipped in from Humboldt area, and that's mm. you know the Bubba Kush was or the Bubba was told to me that you know when he gave me the bag of seeds, he said these are Northern Lights, um, uh, and that made sense because that's you know where most of it was being grown at the time. Uh, when I popped the seeds and I picked the you know the pheno that I was going to keep, um, I named it Baba. I just it just happened. You know, I called everybody. I called everyone Baba. That's why my name's Baba. Because so I <laughs> called I called all my friends Baba, and then it reflected back on. Me. So everybody called me Baba, and then I was like, you know what? Let's just call this the Baba. And uh, signature stopped. seed, signature seed. Yeah. And I, I really, I, mean, I named it, technically it'd be named after, you know, all my friends. All my yeah. friends were my bubbas. So That's it was cool. another bubba. Just another bubba. Do and, you remember uh, where you initially, like, heard the word bubba? Oh, I'm from Florida, man. Everybody, everybody's named bubba here. That's but the phrase. <laughs> kid, kids are born bubba here. It's, it's, <laughs> It's not just a nickname. Some people are actually real name, really real named name Bubba, Bubba here. <laughs> you know, like all, when you see Florida my, man all, newspaper articles underneath, their name is always Bubba. Everybody has a Bubba in their family here. Wow. Huh. I have a, I have a, one of my best friend's uh, kids is nicknamed Bubba. So he's little Bubba. I'm big Bubba. <laughs> <laughs> Uncle Bubba. A hubba Bubba gum. <laughs> Yeah, uh, that's funny. But yeah, the, the Bubba didn't didn't last the test of time, unfortunately. Um, how many how many times did you breed like rebreed it before you, it ran out of like not producing seeds the same way or something? I I'm like I'm speaking uh, from not not having did, ever uh, done it. We only myself. did clones. We only did uh, clones. We we weren't breeding really. You know, we didn't have space back then. It was. Uh, you know, it, it was still highly illegal. We didn't mm -hmm. have um, the space to allocate to breeding. You know, right. we were more about, you know, making money. Maybe maybe you can break it down for me a little bit and for the listeners and the viewers, because not everyone knows about breeding weed or breeding any kind of cannabis. Like, how what is clone? What are clones? How does clone? How do clones work? How do you make a clone of a of a marijuana plant or a hemp plant? Um, you know, it's uh, it, the same process goes for any plant. Really, you take a, a little cutting off the off one of the branches. Um, you dip it in a rooting hormone of sorts, and then you put it in a medium. Um, I mean, everybody has their own little tricks the trade but that's pretty much it you know you either put it in a dome for a, a week or two and eventually you'll see roots coming out of the bottom of your little starter plug so you'll get like a little starter plug of either cocoa or rock wool whatever medium you're using soil um, and then you just take a little cut and stick it in the dirt or the soil and or your medium and wait a couple of weeks uh, keep make sure you keep it fairly moist. Uh, you don't want it to be soaking wet or it won't root. It needs oxygen in the medium still. Uh, but yeah, it's pretty simple. God, I, I mean, it's simple. Once I'm just thinking, once you like, get your system down, once you get the system down, and you, it, it's it becomes pretty easy. You I'm just, just thinking, get your system down. Like I've never heard that explained to me, but it just makes me think like. God, plants are so superior to us. You can't just cut off a fingernail or something, plant it, and make a new me. But you could do that with Bubba. You could cut off a little snippet and regrow a whole new plant. That is crazy. So, 
so technically the OG Kush, if you do find real OG Kush, any anything that my friends are still growing or what I have, the real deal is from one plant in 1992. Wow. So a plant that, that you grew. One mother has produced every clone that's being grown today of OG Kush. And you're the father. It's from mother to <laughs> Clone the clone the clone the clone for almost wow. thirty years. <laughs> so, would you think, like, realistically, the cells from the original are are long gone? I guess, but like, it's it all comes from the same cell. It's sort of like it's all coming from the same cell structure of that original one. It's the, it is like a tree growing out and just keep growing and and being cut off and growing more and cutting up, which is sort of like humanity if you think about it. Like we all. If you trace back, you know, sperm to egg and just like go back through your whole family tree, it's just like going, you know, coming out of a vagina, meeting someone else, either, you know, whatever opposite sex that can reproduce, then that it's like one long line. If you were to slow motion, you know, like speed up a slow motion camera, you, you know, and you were just a blur of walking around your whole life, wherever you go, you know picking up your Jamba Juice and then, you know, whatever, moving around the country, you're creating one long line and then the lineage coming out of you creates the line that continues on. It's sort of the same. Uh, everyone, everything that, that does that kind of seems like it's all one line growing out like a tr- like trees. But that's amazing with the cloning because it's not natural reproduction. You guys are genetically chopping this thing up, making it grow more, but it is the same plant. It really is. Yeah. It's, that's plan. crazy. That's 30 crazy. Years old. Yeah, it's the only way to really guarantee getting the same thing every time. Uh, even if you stabilize genetics and you're producing seeds and you're saying you're going to get so many percent of this variety, you're still going to get phenotypes. I mean, Mother Nature wants to diversify. And if you think about it, if, if you have uh, a mother and a father, they have a kid. Right. And then they have a second kid a year later. How? What are the chances of that kid being the same as the older brother? Yeah, like none. I none. mean, they might look this Never. look similar, but yeah, not the so, same kid. So you kind of think about that in relation to plants. You're always going to get diversity, even if I took two took uh, a Kush male, which you'd have to revert to being a male. Um, and then getting the pollen from that and putting it on a female, you're still going to get a bunch of varieties of different stuff, even though they're the same plant. So when you do that and the, you like see how they're starting to grow and then you realize which ones are the best, I guess, do you like yeah. test? How do you do it? it? You wait till full maturity? It's a real yeah. talent. Yeah. To, to, to pheno hunt takes a lot of practice and talent to find the right male that you want to use. Um, is pretty difficult. You gotta, you gotta have a good eye, and and a and a good intuitive uh, nature of the plant, and that only comes with you know being around it all the time. Right. And true Can breeders you, today are hard to find. You most, gotta get that ten, the ten thousand hours today, and become a master. Most people master. today are just pollen chuckers. You know, they're not really doing the work uh, to stabilize the plant so that they can sell seeds. So most of the seeds you're getting today are like first generations and you don't really know what you're going to get because they didn't do any of the work to stabilize it. What, what is the work? Back crossing, taking the mom and, and crossing it with itself over and over and for years and years and years until you finally have like 10 generations behind it. And wow. you can say, okay, 90% of the time you're going to get this variety or as close to it as possible. And then the yeah, other 10, 10%. That's cool. Yeah, other 10%, you never really know what's, what you're getting. So you, you're knocking out the mutations or the possibility of mutations or just errant. Yeah, I mean, you're not... selecting things for certain traits, you know, uh, whether the traits are smell, taste, yield. Um, you know, you're, you're, you're constantly hunting those traits and then finding the strongest ones. And then you find that and then you back cross it with itself and blah, blah, blah. until you know, you're hoping to get, you know, 90% of the same variety. 
when you were just starting out doing this, you were like baby Bubba starting this off. Um, you didn't have access to like being able to take this stuff to a lab, break it down, figure out exactly the terp count, the, you know, what, what flavonoids are in that. How did you do it? How did you like, was it all eyeball smelling, tasting, smoking it up, seeing how it works, seeing the effects? Like, yeah, how do you do it? You know, I'm kind of jaded. You know, I found you know, the best strain of weed in the world. <laughs> there was nothing else I wanted to smoke. So, and, and no, nobody else wanted to buy anything else. You know, I could right. get eight grand a pound for OG Kush and maybe three or four of for whatever the next popular strain was underneath it. But, so why bother? Know, so why bother making the others? Right? Exactly. Lock it and in. And again, we had little, we had very little space. You know, we we're super paranoid back then. Um, and, uh, you know, you grew the best you could get. So all I grew was OG and Bubba. Bubba Kush wow. for years. That's... I mean, I didn't experiment or play with anything else. I didn't Dude, it makes sense. It's like going would, back to the, going back to the Breaking Bad analogy. Once you figured out the blue meth, you're not trying to sell that other shit anymore. You got yeah. you got the best. Yeah, I mean, I was shipping I was shipping pounds to New York and getting twelve grand a pound. Damn. Back in the day, you were the <laughs> you were the original connect of of all of those. They Crazy. couldn't get it anywhere else. <laughs> How did you grow that? How did you grow that much? People started getting it. Did you have like a secret warehouse or something? No, uh, we, you know, we had, you know, four or six lighters. Some of uh, at times I'd have two houses running at once. Um, and, you know, we had uh, other friends and stuff that got cuts and they were growing it too. So we were able to keep the supply to our, to a minimum select, you know, group of people. That's why the price was so high. Right, and then yeah, then you had, then you, had uh, you know Cypress, Cypress and Snoop, and everybody started singing about it. And then the prices <laughs> that just can't started. hurt, man. Yeah, that, that cannot you know, hurt. By 90, Holy shit, ninety eight, ninety nine. You know, Doctor Green Thumb. You know, mentions Kush. Like that was it. Like that was the first song I think that. I, I asked B the one time what the first song was that he mentioned uh, Bubba K or Kush or Bubba Kush in, and he told me it was Dr. Green Thumb. <laughs> that is crazy. So that's the that's that was, the song that, that kicked off the legend. 97, 98. And then it, then it hit just national. Everyone knew about it. Then everyone wanted it. Were you, oh, yeah. were you, able, to, were you able to supply up to meet the demand? Um, well... Uh, you know, a lot of people were, got the cut by then, too. So it was getting spread out pretty fast at that point. Um, right. Josh was local. Uh, he was from, he lived in L.A. Uh, for most of his youth. Uh, so he knew everybody. He knew a lot of people, and they all got cuts from us, and then they were all growing it. We had like a one, two, there were probably six or seven of us. Back up Bye. a little bit. Just back up a little, like a foot. Oh, I'm only oh, seeing sorry. your nose. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's getting a little chilly here, so I keep pulling oh, forward. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, so probably 90, by 98, 97, 98, there were maybe 10 of us growing OG. And then it just got bigger and bigger and they told two friends and they told two friends and they told two friends. Uh, if only before it worked like I a pyramid it, scheme. Yeah, before yeah. I knew it, all of California was growing OG. If it worked like a pyramid scheme where you were at the top and they were like licensed dealers under you and you got a cut of everyone's sales, that would be sweet. I, I would be, did, did it work I'd like probably that? be wealthier than uh, Bezos. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Holy shit. That's yeah. crazy. I mean, uh, it, it's it's quite a phenomenon, actually. Yeah. You know, it, it was grassroots spread. There was no social media. Nothing. Literal like grassroots that. It spread. It was totally grassroots spread around the world. Like, wow. It is world. No. OG Kush Imagine. and Bubba Kush. 
there. For anyone who's listening, imagine having your name on a thing that you kind of invented, and it's probably sold billions and billions of dollars worth of product around the world, and opened so many minds and uh, gave so many so many people like amazing nights sleep and stuff. That's like a, the true indica. Um, really crazy that 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 legend is. I'm speaking to you. <laughs> that you still exist. <laughs> it's surreal. Yeah. Trust me. I, I, I got to pinch myself sometimes. <laughs> yeah, that's crazy. Like, who have you... This is something that, like, um, for me, I think it's awesome to be able to sesh with the people that actually create the things. You know what I mean? Um, because you're basically touching the, the thing with the legend that made it kind of deal. I, one day I got to smoke with you, by the way. Oh, so we will. Actual... <laughs> Where are you out of? Uh, we're in New York. So okay. technically can't uh, you can just go over the border Not to yet. New Jersey now. No big deal. <laughs> so, now the Woodbridge. There you my go. Old, I built a grow in Woodbridge. Did a lot of, so since people knew you and knew that you came up with this and that you were the one that got it out there, um, like Cypress Hill and Snoop and all these guys, did they want it? Was it like their goal to sesh with you, to smoke with you, the original? Well, get a cut I mean, right from the I, man. I, I was, I mean, I was, uh, I was hanging out, you know, uh, with Kenji a lot and stuff. So I was down in the studio, and and uh, you know, whenever they played, I was backstage. Um, That's so sweet. I mean, you know, we were we were just bros. It wasn't like, uh, any, you know, anything s- special to me. Yeah, it was a novelty, I guess, in the back of my head. Uh, <laughs> but you know, you, I guess you just get used to things. And being in Hollywood, you got used to being around people like that. Oh yeah, I'm sure. Still cool though. It's cool yeah. from an outside oh, yeah. perspective too to to think about it like. Like you, you thought it was cool hanging out with these musicians, but I bet you, because they're weed connoisseurs, um, in a way, they were probably thinking it's cool to be actually hanging out with Bubba, the Bubba Kush guy, and do it like and smoking so. Bubba Kush. No, oh, for real, <laughs> it definitely is. It definitely. I'd is. like to think so. They still <laughs> talk to me. They, they still talk to me. So that's so. awesome. <laughs> yeah, you, you don't have to buy them on Cameo or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> That's cool, man. Um, what was the first celebrity that you ever seshed with, as far as with your own product that you can remember? Uh, Do you remember like the it, first surreal experience? I mean, it it have to be, it have to be be real. That's dope. Yeah, because I mean, I met I met B as soon as I moved to LA. You know, that was ninety six, ninety seven. So, um, and then after that. Uh, I've, I've gotten some people high that are really funny. Uh, the, the funniest person that I ever got high was was uh, Uncle Phil, James Avery, from Fresh really? Prince of Bel Air. Yeah. Oh wow! <laughs> that is a rest great in story. peace, Uncle Phil. Wow. We just, you know, we're on set together. I worked on film. Um, I did about I don't even know how many movies I did, but I did a lot of production. Um, and uh, I was working on a movie with. James and he kept making the comments about weed. And <laughs> I, I finally said to him, I'm like, James, man, you get high. And he's like, Hell yeah. And I was like, oh, man. I grow the best weed in the world. Ever hear of the Kush? He's like, Yeah, I have heard of that. And I've been waiting to try that. And I'm like, Well, I, I'm the guy who made it. And he's like, Oh my God, I want to try it. So I, you I turned I, him I, on. I, I, yeah. So I go, I go back to my trailer, I grab my weed, I go back to James's trailer. I I walk in and he could smell it immediately. He's like, "Holy <laughs> shit!" He's like, "What is that?" I didn't even pull it out of my pocket yet. Wow. Gave him, loaded a bowl, gave him a hit. He was like, "Oh my god, this is the best shit I ever had." And he takes it. He's <laughs> like, "I can only do one hit. I got to go out on the set." He's like, "Wait oh, a minute, give, give me one more." Takes another hit. Then the door starts banging, and I'm like, "Oh shit." They're like, James, you're re- we're, we're, we're ready for you. And open the trailer door, and it was like Jeff Spicoli's van. Just smoke <laughs> pours out of it. The, the assistant director is looking at me like, Bubba, you did not just get James high, did you? And I'm oh, like, 
he, he was so high, man. He couldn't stop laughing. He couldn't oh, focus. God. The director was looking at me like, you dick. I can't believe you got him high, Bubba, because he knew too. He knew. I, that is he funny. Like, oh, my God. You got him high, didn't you? Like, yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> I can only imagine the continuity. It's just like shot for shot. You know, one oh, scene he's man. got perfectly white eyeballs. The next shot he's just completely bloodshot oh, and can't stop laughing. Yeah. What movie yeah, was man. that? God rest his soul, man. He was yeah. a great dude, man. I, I really loved James. He was a nice guy. He, he was a uh, he, he was a bit uh, uh, what's the word uh, temperamental. Um, he had to have everything pretty much right, or he'd, he'd get pissed off um, mm. if. It, on set like if things weren't going yeah. right he'd yell at the director and stuff but <laughs> he was a nice guy man <laughs> i like yeah. the name of no, the that's movie cool. God, what was that called i think that was i think it was called getting played they might have changed the name of it but that was with uh bill bellamy uh vivica fox carmen okay. Electra was in it pretty sure that was the movie that, nice i can't remember anything i feel like gary Busey. dude that's <laughs> that's also attributed to the plan <laughs> it's one of the one of the effects and also just living a long life and having a fucking yeah. awesome party life i love um, that story i was just <laughs> checking the time i do have uh going out to meet with uh mel jackson he, he's uh as a studio out in Georgia, he's been in a ton of movies like uh, Soul Food and oh, cool. a bunch of other stuff. So he's actually flew in today. Uh, we'll how how long you got? I'll, I'll set a clock. Tell me how, how much time you have left, you think? Uh, let's wrap it up in like 15. Okay, you got it. Dude, that's an awesome story, man. Yeah, any, I love any, that story. Any other comedians that you've hung out with? Because I know a lot of comedians, uh, like, uh, especially in LA. Like, it's kind of a ritual my, to smoke weed after the show or, or even before a show, my, right? My best comedian friend uh, is Joey Coco. Joey Coco Diaz. He is mm-hmm. the funniest man in the world. Uh, Joey man. Diaz is hilarious. I love, I love Joey. Him and I were, him and I were uh, camped out. Well, we, we were shot a movie together up in the mountains. So we were stuck in the mountains for like a month and a half together. And every night we had dinner together. Every night we'd, he'd come, we'd walk off set, he'd change, <laughs> come and knock on my door. He'd come in my room, we'd smoke a bowl, then we'd go eat dinner. Good times, awesome. man. He is a funny dude, man. I love Joe. A lot of people <laughs> say that that like he's one of those guys that you can't smoke under the table. Like he can smoke anyone under the table. And, oh, he's, he's a madman. <laughs> he is he is just hilarious man have you ever gone like hit for hit with him like just see how far how far he can take it um you know we, getting wasted getting completely stoned off your asses <laughs> it, you know we'd have you know our our before dinner smoke sesh and then after dinner smoke sesh and then we'd start over the next day but it wasn't like we had you know hours and time just sitting around watching tv getting high it was you know, we either were working or eating, and in between everything, we we smoked. <laughs> I feel like you're one of those guys that sort of like, um, it's like a Willie Nelson type of mecca to people who love Bubba Kush or love just Kush in general. That the young celebrities should be like wanting to find you, wanting to like smoke with you, and and be part of the legend. You know what I mean? Like it's like the anyone who meets and smokes with a legend is now part of the legend. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> never thought of it like that. <laughs> seriously, <laughs> you know, they're cameos in your life now, That's and funny. you're a cameo in their life. That's pretty cool. Uh, yeah, never thought of it like that. Have you ever yeah. thought of writing a book about your your whole life and experience and and oh, being yeah. a? Yeah, I started writing it. I I think I got like two pages done in the last seven years. <laughs> oh, jeez. <laughs> but. <laughs> What I'm going to do, I just got to make time uh, to work with, you know, somebody that uh, I can narrate my stories to and they can write it. That's all it takes, man. Yeah, that's pretty much what I have. I do have somebody that wants to do it. I just, I have to make the time for it. Uh, Seriously, what's going on? Stuff in the background. Yeah, we got some stuff in the background. What's up, guys? How's it going? 
<laughs> yeah, I think one of the easiest ways to, to write about your life is just to have have people who are actually genuinely curious and want to talk about, you know, your experiences and just break it down and, and record everything, you know, like you'll, you'll eventually get it all out there. You'll, and you'll stumble on stories that you completely lost, you know, the stories that just were blocked out. And then once you, you, you're in conversation about all these things that are related, this is something that's great about weed. You start to reconnect those pathways and like stories overlap. And then you're just like, all right, put a pin in that story. Here's another story. But if you've got someone there, that's actually like, paying attention and able to like take it all down then you can really like double back get back to the original story well, which the, is something the, maybe, maybe we can do that a little bit right now like oh well i, I cut you off go ahead well, we'll, we'll get back uh, to i was the, just the gonna timeline. say the, the meeting uh the meeting with mel jackson today is to discuss the documentary so we're gonna sh start uh storyboarding it and getting all the ideas out today um that's awesome he, he's also part of uh uh, his sister was Sharon Thomas. Uh, she was a big producer for commercial, all the military commercials. Uh, hmm. She recently passed away, um, and uh, they started a foundation, which Bubba Kush Brand was offered a being a part of, which is a huge honor. That's uh, cool. So, so we're going to talk about it. It's Cancer Foundation. Nice. Okay. That's well. That's good to be behind. Holy shit. Yeah. Have have you ever I want to just go a little bit more into the, like the different celebrities that probably enjoy this Bubba Kush and other Kush brands OG. Um have you ever met Mike Tyson? Uh I'm coming close to that. Like <laughs> I was supposed to go visit uh I was supposed to go visit a farm out in California and his offices are also at that farm. So there was a there's a good chance that I will be meeting him soon. I know Sweet. I will. Our paths are gonna cross, especially now yeah. he's in the cannabis space. So hell yeah, It'll man! Happen. There should be It'll there should happen. be a, a Bubba Kush I, licensed I'm actually, Tyson brand. I'm I'm friends with uh I'm friends with Lennox Lewis, so oh, nice. it'll be interesting to have that conversation with Mike when I see him. I'll be like, yeah. I got high with Lenny and you. Dude, <laughs> you knocked both of them out. Oh yeah, uh, no, no, that was, <laughs> Lennox Lewis is probably one of the coolest dudes in the world too. He's just one of the nicest guys. That's cool, and he loves the eye. That's <laughs> awesome, man. I got to get him on the show. Like yeah. we have, we have a segment on the show called Sea Body, and it's all about like athletes that smoke or that are you know that have CBD brands and things like that. Uh, that because it it really is beneficial to ex athletes um, trying to recover from a lifetime of beating their bodies up. Yeah. Well, let's since you're going to be dump jumping out of here in a few minutes, let's talk about your CBD brand that you're okay. you're launching now because it's this is brand new to the market. Like this is probably one of the prototypes, right? Like this is so new. Yeah, that was a prototype bottle. Yeah. Yeah, we felt yeah. really special doing. We unboxed it and opened it and tried it yesterday for the first time. I'm gonna take another <laughs> another spritz of it right under the tongue, right? Yeah, anywhere Couple. really. Mm -hmm. And just it, absorbs right into your mucous membrane, just, like. Yeah, I mean, you don't really swallow any of it. Right. So this is the Bubble Kush brand of CBD now. Yep. Yep. So tell me a little about it while we, while we still have you. Um. Yeah, I. You know, I. I was always skeptical about most CBD products because a, if it's an isolate, what good's it going to do your body? You're getting just CBD. You, you really need more than just one cannabinoid for it to be considered medicine. Um, yet, you know, CBD isolate alone does have an effect with seizure patients and inflammation. Um, but I never ever taken a CBD product and felt any different. Um, most of the products out there are, are made from hemp seed oil um, or they're in a form that's just not bioavailable to your body. Um, and a lot of it's just placebo. You know, I think most of them are most of it's just sugar pills. Um, hmm. I really think it's a sketchy industry. Uh, everybody jumped on board. Nobody was a cannabis grower. Um, but it just it didn't it seemed like a, a bogus industry to me. So when I found this Iotamus product, uh, 
it was developed from uh, patients in uh, Uganda, uh, malaria patients, and they were taking tincture medicine. And the mm-hmm. doctor that was administering it um, noticed that, you know, they drop it under their tongue, hold it under their tongue for however long, and then they reflex swallowed most of it. So they were wasting, you know, 90% of the medicine. Um, so he figured out a way to lower the viscosity with this carrier solution. And he ended up saving the government a ton of money in medicine and made the medicine more effective. Wow. So af- after That's hearing win-win. that story and then applying it to a broad spectrum CBD formula, uh, broad spectrum meaning THC free, but all the other cannabinoids still intact. I was like, okay, you know what? I'll give it a try. Send me a sale. So he sent me a bottle and uh, I didn't get high that day. I waited till about noon uh, to try it. And I took two sprays and I immediately felt a head change. I was like, (laughs) I wasn't high. Mm-hmm. When I was I was calmly energized and and focused, like nice. it, it made me like okay, I got to get shit done today. What am I gonna nice. do? I got to get shit done. Mm-hmm. And it wasn't like anxiety. It wasn't you know. It was a real calm, energized feeling. I was like, holy shit, this stuff works. And then <laughs> I and then I you know guinea pigged a couple other people. And they said the same thing. They're like, oh, my God, I've never had a CBD product that worked before that did something to me. You know, I can't right. legally say any health benefits it has. Right, right. Um, but I good felt CBD, Good CBD, does, like especially strong CBD that's, a, you know, the right amount for you does ha- have, you know, people say it doesn't have, you know, a psychoactive effect or whatever. But like there really does have an effect. You know, you do really feel it and it. it I, I obviously, yeah, you away. can't make you can't make medical claims and stuff because it's not FDA, blah blah blah, whatever, right. blah, bullshit. But yeah, like when when you are taking CBD and it's actually doing something for you, you totally feel it. Oh, and that's uh, amazing. Like, right, like right now, I'm loose. I am ready. Like I'm feeling great because <laughs> like we, I took those sprays when we first started talking, like an hour ago, and now I just took a couple more, you know, re-upped, and uh, yeah, I'm feeling great. That's the only CBD the I've had today. Man. No, the testimonials I'm getting are just amazing. You know, I have people everywhere from uh, I had night terrors for the past 10 years and couldn't sleep. This stuff is a game changer. Um, I have major anxiety before I go into meetings, uh, before I fly on airplanes. Now I I don't have to sneak away and get high. I just have this little bottle (laughs) of CBD and it Mm -hmm. doesn't even get me high. But man, I feel calm. And I'm ready to get on that airplane and get where I'm going and, or go in that a meeting or whatever. Um, my, you know, my dad told me a weird one recently because he smoked weed for 50 years. Um, they're the, the My parents make uh, dabbers. They're Mystic Timber is the name of the company. They make these little wood, hit, wood handle dabbers. They're everywhere. But he was telling me that um, – He's he hasn't had dreams for so long because of the weed. Like for some reason, he just doesn't remember yeah. any of his dreams. But the last like six months, he started taking CBD for like just pains in his legs and back from just being on his feet all day and whatnot. And he said, ever since he started taking the CBD, he's having vivid dreams like yeah, out of nowhere. Awesome. He's got nothing else to explain. He's done no other changes in his life except for incorporating CBD on top of the THC that, you know, he's never going to stop. But like, obviously, something's different. And the fact that he's having dreams now and able to remember them and that they're very vivid. I like I've never heard that as a side effect, but that's pretty cool. If that if there's some correlation there, that's pretty neat because uh, there's probably yeah, a lot of people. Some people probably have that. Like, I've never marijuana's never stopped me from dreaming but for some people that might be it an effect that that pot could do to you and if cbd could f- flip that who knows maybe that might work for you that's something you could test if you you know it's obviously not uh tested in a lab or anything this is just a personal experience but hmm i wonder no, but anyway there's, yeah, there's, yeah there's so many i've, I've talked through this show, I've talked to so many people who've had insane life changes because of CBD, and it's really awesome to hear all the stories and and THC. Obviously, I mean, like both of them are a really good medicine, especially when they work together. Like you're saying, like entourage effect, um, and all the other cannabinoids. So you don't even when you're with your product because you said it's a broad spectrum. Like THC helps, and you can always toss a little of that in the side. You know, if you're in, in a state where you you can get it legally or whatever, um, or like not legally if you're 
on the sly, but yeah, broad spectrum is awesome. Like it definitely, especially in states where you can't legally get your hands on THC. Um, yeah, that's the next best I'll, thing. You're, I'll never make an isolate product. I'll never yeah, make an isolate product. It's always going to be full medicine. You know, the, you touched on something, you know, it, I always, I always got, I always felt like I was helping people, but I never had these testimonials that, that really like nailed it down for me. And, and what I'm realizing is, is I'm, I'm, I'm getting high from this. Like there's no better high than having somebody tell you how you help them. That's so cool. It, it is. It's awesome. And that's that's why I really love this product is because I'm getting all, all these new testimonials and and it really, you know, I was I was nervous. I was like, man, is it just me, um, or does this stuff really work? And now I'm full blown and you know I'm going full steam ahead with this, and I'll be developing other CBD products as well from this. That's so cool, man. Like just have people who who give you that feedback to to a brand, you know. The brands actually love it because they realize that they're not just sending this stuff out into the void and getting money back. They're actually helping people, really yeah. helping. And that is so powerful and positive. So I it, love that that's how, that you're doing that with the CBD now. And for all those years and still continuing on with the Bubba Kush and the OG Kush, um, opening people's minds and opening people's like eyes to reality you know like being people being able to not just get that you know giggly thing but uh some strains like you combine them with other things or um just on their own in the right atmosphere in the right environment with the right music and the right level of comfort and chilling in the right place and your mind's in the right mindset that day and you you can come up with things you would never come up with you can connect dots that you've never connected and it's because of the the plant helping you to do that. I think it's it's amazing, and the, the fact that you're the guy that, you know, it all stems from that one mother. It's one mom. dude. It's been it's been so dope talking to you today, man. It's been awesome, and I definitely want to have you back. Uh, I'd love to whenever come you're back. whenever you're in town. We've got an awesome studio here. You know, come hang out in the studio if you want, uh, or wherever you are. If, if we're like around when you you're wherever you're gonna be next, if like in L.A. or something, we'd love to swing by and see what what you got cooking over there but uh you're always welcome here man very awesome thank you to totally cool having you on the show love the stories this is an awesome awesome i got plenty more <laughs> great thank you so much man you're welcome brother you'd be good anytime Peace. thanks Not man bubba kush bur burger everyone <laughs> in this podcast, live stream, video, audio presentation, or YouTube video, or its related social media pages or interactions are for informational purposes only. CBD Source Center and the CBD Source Podcast does not offer medical advice. Its host, Cole Cheney, is not a medical professional. His experiences with cannabidiol and other cannabinoids are his own and may not affect you the same way. Everybody's endocannabinoid system is different. Statements made regarding CBD and THC products have not been evaluated by the Food and Drug Administration. The efficacy of these products and the testimonials made have not been confirmed by FDA-approved research. These products are not intended to diagnose, treat, cure, or prevent any disease. All information presented here is not meant as a substitute for, or alternative to, information from healthcare practitioners. Please consult your healthcare professional about potential interactions or other possible complications before using any product. The Federal Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act requires this notice.